Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today it is finally time to review Starlink Battle for Atlas for the Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written by the lovely Dom Rese Lincoln and has been adapted for video by me. But anyway, I've got an awful lot to do today, so let's not waffle any longer and dive right into things. <laughs> It takes guts to try and revive a dormant genre, especially one that burned bright in the zeitgeist before extinguishing itself just as quickly. Activision and Harmonix tried such a feat with Guitar Hero Live and Rock Band 4 back in 2015, but their hopes of a resurgent rhythm action craze never found the spark it needed. And yet here we are in 2018 with a new Toys to Life game from Ubisoft of all people. With Disney Infinity and Lego Dimensions now banished to bargain bins all over the world, and Skylanders on an indefinite hiatus that's seemingly destined to endure the same fate, in swoops Starlink Battle for Atlas with its plastic weapons and modular ships. The while Skylanders always struggle to feel like a proper action RPG experience beyond the gimmick of its expensive peripherals, Starlink's use of NFC-chipped spaceships doesn't define it. In fact, the need to rely on physical items is entirely optional, but the different versions available for purchase do somewhat muddy the waters regarding what you actually get. The starter pack, for example, only allows you to play as two pilots, thankfully one of those is our boy Fox McCloud, and with two ships. The standard digital version unlocks more, but naturally without the toys, and the deluxe digital version unlocks everything from the get-go, but again without any toys. Luckily, it just so happens to be an engaging and rewarding mixture of dogfighting and space exploration right here on Nintendo Switch, plus a little thing called a uh, Star Fox? Anyone? In practice, it's what No Man's Sky should have been when it launched in 2016. A vast open planetary system of planets, asteroid fields, outlaw outposts, and cosmic secrets. You can hold R to enter a hyperdrive at any time while in space, and you'll instantly zoom through blankets of space rock, burn through a planet's atmosphere, and touch down on its surface in real time. No loading scenes or cutscenes, unless you fast travel, that is. Just the transition from dogfighting to exploration in a matter of moments. You can't ever leave your ship, but even confined to the cockpit of various vessels, the sheer scope of its setting really evokes a Mass Effect vibe. Powered by the Snowdrop engine, which is the same one used for Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom Battle, exploring the titular Atlas system is a cosmic dream. The developer, Ubisoft Toronto, of Splinter Cell Blacklist fame, has had to make some noticeable graphical sacrifices to get the multi-open world sandbox such as this working on the Nintendo Switch, including noticeable downscaling in places and rasterized on a number of assets, but it's entirely worth it for a game with little slowdown. It does look a little visually inferior to those iterations found on PS4 and Xbox One, but it's still a strikingly vibrant place to inhabit. And honestly, did I mean, did you expect it's a weaker machine? Did you expect anything less? Sunsets still glare the amber effervescence on the horizon, and planets hang like beads of glass amidst an ocean of stars, gas, and detritus. Ports are always going to have to make some sacrifices to operate on Switch, but with skies that turn from red to blue, and draw distances that are impressively broad, Starlink is far from a broken counterpart to its PS4 and Xbox One versions. Planet topographies can sometimes become a little bit repetitive. There are only so many rocky valleys and flowing dunes you can glide across before you've seen them all, but every hand-designed world still has its own distinct character. There are seven planets in total to explore in one large planetary system, which technically makes this Ubisoft's biggest open world yet. Its story isn't the most memorable of plots and is easily the weakest link in Starlink's armor. You'll play one of seven pilots who find themselves serving as the only defense against the zealous plans of the nefarious baddie Grax, who, in true bad guy fashion, is using an army of alien robots known as the Forgotten Legion to take over the universe. The story might be quite cliched in execution, and some of the characters are never properly fleshed out, but thankfully the voice work is decent, so it's an enjoyable, if predictable, ride. This is where the Toys to Life aspect comes in. 
if you're buying the starter pack on Switch, you'll get a ship and two pilots, namely the Switch exclusive R-Wing and Fox McCloud, which is uh, is just a little bit special. But don't worry, we'll get onto that momentarily. The other pilot is Mason Ranner, but you'll also get a copy of the game, two additional weapons, and a special mount for your Joy-Cons that makes the whole thing work. The wings are detachable, so you can mix and match the parts from multiple ships and weapons by simply snapping on each modular part with a tiny little click. There's no getting away from the fact that playing with a controller that has a toy ship strapped to it is, at least for the first hour or so, rather awkward. This is a game specifically designed to be used in either tabletop or docked mode when using the physical toys, since the game needs to be able to communicate with your Switch and the peripherals at the same time. You can, however, play in handheld mode if you're just playing the digital version, or opt to play digitally, which basically just means you don't use the toys. There's even drop-in, drop-out co-op, which again uses the sort of the digital system. Considering every other Toys to Life model was built around the expensive prerequisite of buying lots of characters and add-ons, Starling makes it possible to have all ships, all pilots, and all weapons instantly available from the game's menus, provided of course you spring for the deluxe version. The only caveat is that if you do switch back to using the toys, you'll be restricted purely to the ones that you own in physical form. Thankfully though, your hands are never restricted behind even the bulkiest of ships. We tried four of the designs during our playthrough, although uh, there are some fun designs you can make, and generally they're not even heavy enough to affect your comfort. But you will look a bit of a plonker controlling a game whilst a toy spaceship lights up on the tip of your controller. Pilots snap into the front of the grip and serve as traditional character builds with their own skill trees and leveling systems. Pilots even have a unique ability that can be a real lifesaver in battle. Being able to call down another R-Wing for support as Fox complete with the original Corneria theme from the original Star Fox. Oh god, it's lovely. Never fails to bring a smile to our faces. Ships, on the other hand, are more like lives, much like Skylanders models, and can only take so much damage before they're defeated and can no longer fly and need to be repaired. If you're playing digitally, you can just swap one vessel out for another, but if you're playing physically with the starter pack only, you'll need to walk back to your giant starship in orbit, the Equinox, and start over. Thankfully, it doesn't take long to traverse the game's surface, and with a handy map for each planet that slowly reveals itself as you explore, you rarely feel like you're having to backtrack too far to reach the battle that you previously lost. You can swap wings and weapons at any time, whether with a physical toy combination or via the good old-fashioned menus, and it's here that players of any age can get creative with their imagination. Snap a weapon on backwards and it'll shoot awkwardly in that direction on screen, if you fancy. Twist a wing in the opposite direction and your ship will show its unique take on modular design on screen. Basically anything goes. You can even add multiple different wings onto one another, creating some absolutely ludicrous looking machines that can actually be surprisingly useful in practice. It's very silly and it's reminiscent of Skylander's Swap Force's take on combining characters. Swapping wings and bodies will also affect the stats on your vessel, so make sure you keep an eye on them rather than just going gung-ho with whatever looks the most ludicrous. Weapons come in multiple varieties, ranging from frost-based missile launchers to cannons that create gravity vortexes, but the real fun comes in combining these attacks into one. With the Forgotten Legion often coming in in their own fire or ice-based forms, you'll need to mix up which two weapons work best in tandem. Firing a gravity vortex with a fiery gatling gun will take on ice-based enemies in seconds, while hitting them with their own element will really do not much at all. Swapping out these weapons can be a little bit awkward, whether you're physically snapping them on or doing so via the menus, which can serve to take you out of the moment, but we can't really think of a better way to do it. Okay, now let's talk Star Fox. Back when it was first announced at E3 2017, the use of Fox and Zarwing felt like a cool, if slightly soulless product of Ubisoft's growing partnership with Nintendo, but in reality, you're getting more than just an excuse to play with an Arwing toy. Fox isn't just some side quest tucked in the corner of Starlink's universe like a DLC add-on, the game weaves him and the rest of the gang into the main story with full dialogue and cutscenes, so you can play the entire game with him from start to finish, and it doesn't feel out of place, it's genuinely brilliant. There are also some exclusive missions that you can follow at any time as well. Uh, you cycle between missions by pressing left and right on the D-pad at any point during the game, just so you know. Fox and co are off to track down Wolf O'Donnell and uncover how the furry villain phases into Starlink's wider universe. But it's in how seamlessly the Star Fox license and the smooth controls of its flight model mesh together that makes this the definitive version of the game. From that unique real-time transition between space exploration, dogfighting, on-land combat and missions, to the empowering setup of its control system, the integration of the game and license is so seamless that it's hard to imagine playing Starlink without an R-Wing. It's a far cry from the arguably awkward control scheme 
game of Star Fox Zero and is easily the most enjoyable entry in the series since Lilat Wars, if you count it as part of the series. If Nintendo isn't making a new Star Fox at this stage, the incredible work Ubisoft Toronto has done evoking the classic days of the franchise should be all it needs to fast-track its proper return to Switch. As we've mentioned before, gameplay flits between space-based dogfights and planet-based exploration. You'll need to use your hyperdrive to reach far-off new planets, which avoids any sort of monotonous weight by periodically presenting you with a potential pirate ambush. The purplish vortex you're traveling through will turn into a wall of energy, and you'll need to fly through the gradually smaller hole within to avoid the trap. If you do get caught, then you'll need to fight a squadron of enemy fighters. Flight controls are incredibly easy to master, and it'll be mere minutes before you're looping the loop and zoning in on other ships to blast them into atoms. Enemy ships are always clearly marked, and there are always other markers and signposts on screen to ensure that you know how many enemies are left in a given battle. You can even take on much larger dreadnoughts, which serve as space-based bosses, making for some epic encounters that will test your flight skills time and time again. On land, your ship will assume a hover mode where you'll be able to skim across the planet's surface, exploring and engaging in combat and other activities. This is where you'll spend a vast majority of your time in Starlink, and it's here that a few of the cranks begin to appear in the gameplay loop. As you'd expect from an Ubisoft game in 2018, Starlink has plenty of RPG leveling mechanics, and you'll need to encounter enemies with gradually higher levels as you push further and further into the game. However, in order to meet these levels, you'll need to grind, and that means defeating imp hives and all sorts of other things which can be turned into outposts. Outposts can then be used to access missions, which in turn nets you XP and money to spend on upgrades. But in order to utilize these upgrades, you'll need specific resources found on every world, and that means defeating tower-like structures called harvesters. These harvesters are periodically planted by a roving boss called a Prime, think the Reapers from Mass Effect, which serve as another kind of mini-boss that you'll need to defeat in order to free the planet of enemy control. You'll cycle through this loop quite often in Starlink, since the game is all about the seesaw of power between these alien invaders and each world's natives. It can become a little bit predictable after a while, but thankfully harvesters, which have their own defenses that you'll need to dodge, come in multiple forms and battle with primes, also have multi-stage faces that will keep you traveling right across the planet in order to bring it down. But 15 hours in, and you'll have repeated this slightly variable cycle many times over. It's indicative of a modern rpg light genre, and something that fits Ubisoft's design ideas to a T, but it ends up relying on this loop a little bit too much much for its own good. However, even with this grind, there's just so much to keep you entertained along the way. Soon you're discovering loads of little things to do, like scanning local wildlife, and it's nothing out of this world, but it is genuinely really enjoyable. What might seem like a cheap reason to sell toys in the run-up to Christmas soon reveals itself to be so much more. With its exclusive use of some substantial Star Fox content, you're getting the best version of Starlink Battle for Atlas on Nintendo Switch. And with a more accessible and ultimately enjoyable version of no Man's Sky's gameplay mechanics and Mass Effect's original vision, you're getting one of the best dogfighting slash space exploration games you can buy outside of Elite Dangerous. Its gameplay loop does run out of steam after a little while thanks to the required grind, but with its surprisingly ungreedy approach to content access and Toys to Life integration, Starlink really could be the spark that reignites the genre's renaissance. Okay, it's rambly time, and I know I didn't do one in the last review, but I wrote that one, so I sort of felt like I'd said everything I could. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, I really like Starlink. Like, I really, really like Starlink. Far more than I thought I would. I went in thinking it would be a decent game, but I walked out of it, and it's just really good. I keep being drawn back into it. I sort of think, okay, I'll play for an hour or something like that, and I end up doing, like, four hours worth. It really sucks you in, and it's genuinely enjoyable. And I don't really have that much to say about it other than I really, really sodding enjoy it. I can't necessarily speak to Dom's comparison to other games, uh, except for things like Mass Effect, because I love Mass Effect. But uh, yeah, overall, I mean, it's um, it feels to me what the... Um, what Star Fox should have evolved into. It's that same sort of dogfighting idea in space, but it's just sort of evolved to a different, sort of arguably better idea. And it's just a little bit more modern, there's more stuff to do. It's not on rails, it's very open, really enjoyable, and, uh, you know, it genuinely, 
genuinely really surprised me. As I said, it, I thought it was just going to be good, but nothing special. But really, this is deserving of a 9 out of 10. I found myself really genuinely surprised at just how good this game is. The Star Fox stuff as well is absolutely beautifully done, like really, really well integrated. Uh, you know, you'll find Fox in most of the cutscenes, he'll have lines of dialogue and stuff like that. It's, it's woven so well into it. And um, I can't speak for the Xbox One and PS4 versions, but I imagine they've probably worked around it by either having other characters or more likely, I think maybe just, you know, they don't have Fox doing his little quips and every, every now and then, or, you know, getting involved, or maybe the cutscenes are shorter, I don't know. Um, but it, it really is beautifully well woven. And honestly, I, I feel like it is a Star Fox game. I've played exclusively as Fox because I wasn't doing the review, so I didn't have to play as the others. Um, but yeah, I've been enjoying it immensely and I love it. I really, really do. Haven't had a chance to play the co-op yet, but it does look ruddy lovely. But anyway, I think that's enough rambling for me because my voice is hurting and I need to have lunch. So I'm, uh, I'm going to sign off from that. But uh, yeah, cheers.